You want to learn how to pre-flight your Cessna airplane efficiently and fast? Then check out this video. Hi guys, I'm back again with a new Europilot Center tutorial. In my videos, I'm handing you tools, tips and tricks used by professional pilots to make your flying safer and of course even more fun and enjoyable. If you're new to the Europilot Center channel, don't forget to subscribe by clicking the button below. In this tutorial, I'll explain you how to perform a pre-flight inspection, including a standardized workflow as recommended by the manufacturer. When spending a lot of time around airplanes, I frequently see people conducting a quick walk around, not really checking the things they should. In some rare cases, I've even seen pilots not doing a walk around at all. My advice, the day that you haven't done a proper walk around will probably be the day you wish you would have done one. Let's get started. Consistency is key. Use a checklist. In the Cessna Pilot Operating Handbook Section 4, which covers normal procedures, you'll find a pre-flight inspection checklist that will start you off inside the cabin and moves counterclockwise around the airplane. This is a great checklist, but according to me a little too condensed. So at Europilot Center we've created a more in-depth checklist to help you better. You can download our customized pre-flight checklist in the comment section below or on the Europilot Center website. Note that this checklist is for reference only and that the official manufacturer checklist always has priority over this one. Before you start your walk around, Cessna recommends to park your airplane in a ground attitude to make fuel sampling more accurate. Also make sure the wing, tail and control surfaces are free from any small accumulation of frost, ice or snow. And when it's bug season, ensure your leading edges are clean as well. Make sure you have a clean, unobscured window. If a night flight is planned, check if all external and internal lights are operational and make sure a flashlight is on board. Let's take our checklist and start with section 1, the cabin. Ensure your pitot tube cover is removed and stowed in the glove box. Next, let's check if the original pilot operating handbook is on board and accessible to the pilot. The same applies to the Garden G1000 cockpit reference guide. Since you need to know if your airplane is loaded within the weight and balance restrictions, you need to have a weight and balance document on board. Let's set the parking brake by setting both tow brakes with the rudder pedals. Pull the handle aft and rotate it 90 degrees down. Now remove the control wheel lock. Be careful to use both hands in order not to scratch the G1000 screens and stow it in the box in between the two front seats. Ensure the magneto switch is off and that the magneto key is removed. It's a good practice to put the key on top of the dash so you can see temporarily from the outside if the key has been removed. Next item is check if the avionics switch bus 1 and 2 are off. Now we switch the red master switch on. Note that this switch consists of a combined alternator battery switch. By doing so, the main battery is now providing 24 volts to the electrical bus 1 and the essential bus which will in turn provide power to the left display, also called the primary flight display. So we'll check that after a few seconds the PFD will turn on. The PFD is the only way to check the fuel quantity indicators and we need to verify that no low fuel warning is present on the left nor the right fuel tank. This will happen when there's less than 5 US gallons in any tank for more than 60 seconds. The low oil pressure enunciator and the low vacuum enunciator must be present. This is to verify if the sensors are picking up a signal. Because this is an airplane with advanced glass cockpit avionics, we have to check the forward and aft avionics cooling system. Overheating could slow down computers or cause in-flight failure. We do this by switching the avionics switch bus number 1 temporarily on and checking if the forward fan is heard. When verified, we switch the avionics bus 1 off again. Now we turn avionics switch bus number 2 on. Almost immediately after this, you'll hear the PFD warning sound, which you can cancel by pushing the outer right PFD soft key. Check if the aft avionics fan is heard. While we have power on the avionics bus 2, the autopilot will go to its self-testing phase 
and you may hear the autopilot self-test complete sound. When this happens, no further action is required and you can turn avionic switch bus number 2 off. Next, switch the pitot heat switch on. Notice the increase in amps on the main battery. Carefully check that the pitot tube is warm to the touch within 30 seconds. Thereafter, turn the pitot heat switch off. A low volt warning will show when the battery voltage falls below 24 volts. Now, turn the master switch both alternator and battery off again. Set the elevator trim to the takeoff position by aligning the white line with the triangular shaped takeoff indicator. Set the fuel selector to both. This will ensure fuel is taken from both fuel tanks simultaneously. We have to ensure that the alternate static port is off by pushing the knob in. Last item on our list will be the fire extinguisher. This BCF type extinguisher is located between the two front seats. You'll have to check if it's properly secured and if the gauge pointer is in the green arc. This completes section 1, the cabin. Now let's go to item 2, the empennage, also called the tail section of the airplane. First, we're going to open the baggage compartment door and get the fuel drip stick and drain cup, which we need later on. After closing the baggage compartment again, it's a good time to check the general condition, especially for dents and scratches. Next, we're going to take a closer look at the leading edge of the left horizontal stabilizer. Thereafter, we're moving to the elevator horn balance and we're going to move the elevator up and down to check the freedom of movement. Let's check if the elevator bombing strap is present. Bombing straps are found on airplanes in order to form an electrically conductive path that has the capacity to safely conduct any fault current that is imposed on it. Next, we're checking the two elevator static dischargers, also called static wicks. Static wicks dissipate static that can develop as you fly through areas of uncharged particles such as rain, snow, fog, dust or ash. As the airplane flies through the particles, positive charges deflect and negative charges attach to the airframe, building up and eventually discharging. Without the wicks, there's a potential for audio disturbance, weak radio transmissions and even complete loss of communication. The next item will be the condition of the elevator hinge. Check if a bolt and a nut are present and check if the nut is secured. Let's now take a closer look below the elevator. This way we can check the condition of the rudder control cable interconnect and the rudder and elevator steering horns. Again, check for proper attachment of nuts and bolts. Ensure any tail tie down has been removed as well. Let's move back up along the rudder and check the condition of the fixed rudder trim. But don't touch it. Verify the two static discharges are present. Ensure the rudder gust lock is removed and check the rudder hinges. Now we can check the general condition of the two VOR glide slope antennas, check the rudder horn balance, the red beacon light and the white navigation light. Now let's move down again and verify the rudder control cable interconnect, the rudder and elevator steering horn. On the right elevator, you will find the elevator trim which is connected to the elevator trim actuator. Check proper attachment, nuts and bolts. Do not move the elevator trim. Check the elevator trim piano hinges and the elevator hinges. Verify if two static discharges are present. Check the bombing strap, elevator horn balance and move the elevator one more time up and down to check freedom of movement. Now move to the right horizontal stabilizer leading edge and check the empennage general condition for dents and scratches. Check the aft empennage access panel and make sure it's secured. Check the condition of the emergency locator transmitter antenna. The two large combined VHF communication and GPS antennas, the outside air temperature probe in the middle and the XM weather and music antenna. On the lower section of the tail, check the condition of the marker beacon and transponder antenna. Depending on which equipment your airplane has, you may find a DME antenna and or ADF antenna as well. This completes the empennage section. The right wing trailing edge section 3 is next.
We're checking the general condition of the flaps, the flap tracks and the flap actuator. Let's now verify the freedom of movement of the right aileron. This includes a good check of the piano hinges, the aileron actuator, aileron bonding strap, the three balance weights, the two static dischargers, the wing fairing, followed by the strobe light, green navigation light and the navigation light indicator, ending with the general condition of the wingtip fans. We're now moving to section 4, the right wing. It's important to check the condition of the leading edge, the landing and taxi light if installed, the angle of attack vane if installed. Make sure not to touch nor move the angle of attack vane. This is not a style flapper switch. Remove the wing tie down, check the two cabin air intakes for any obstructions. Check the main wheel tire and brakes if no wheel fairings are installed. Examine tire sidewalls for patterns of shallow cracks called weather checks. These cracks are evidence of tire deterioration caused by age, improper storage or prolonged exposure to weather. Check the tread of the tire for depth, wear and cuts. The tire must be replaced if fibers are visible. Check the brake wear pads. Brake pads have a slot in the center that serves several engineering purposes, but also doubles as a wear indicator. Check to see how much of that slot is left. If it's almost gone, new pads should be installed. Now it's time to drain the right fuel tank to the five quick drain valves located underneath the wing. Remember, this aircraft uses FGAS 100 low lead. Fuel will smell like gasoline and will be blue in color. Water is heavier than fuel and will appear on the bottom of the drain cup. If any water is detected in the fuel system, all drain valves must be drained again. The wings should then be gently rocked and the tail lowered to the ground to move any further contaminants to the sampling points. Repeated samples should then be taken at all quick drain points until all contamination has been removed. If after repeated sampling, evidence of contamination still exists, the fuel tanks should be completely drained and the fuel system cleaned. After draining is complete and no water or any other contaminants were present, use the steps on the fuselage and strut to open up the fuel filler cap and pour the fuel back into the tanks. Take the drip stick, lower the drip stick all the way down to the bottom and put your thumb on top of it. Now pull the drip stick out and read the amount of fuel. Multiple measurings may be necessary to obtain a correct value. Now check the fuel filler cap fence. Close the cap completely and ensure it's tightly sealed. If the fuel filler caps are not properly closed, a loss of fuel in flight will occur due to the lower pressure over the wing. Time to check section number 5, the nose. Ensure the cabin air vent is closed. If it's still open, go inside the cabin and push the cabin air vent lever fully forward. Check the engine cowling for missing screws, etc. Now let's take the drain cup again and drain the three quick drain valves underneath the nose section. Another very important step during our pre-flight is checking the oil quantity. In order to do this, open the oil cap, unscrew the dipstick and pull it out slowly. Let the lower part rest on the oil filler tube. Read the quantity. Never operate with less than 5 quarts of oil. It's your pilot center recommendation to keep the oil level around 7 and fill it up to 8 quarts for extended flights. Always make sure to use the correct grade of oil. Never mix different grades of oil. Adding oil is pretty easy. Just put a paper disposable funnel inside the filler tube, let the dipstick rest on the funnel, Meanwhile, add one quart of oil at a time and when finished, close it hand tight. Avoid over tightening it as this will cause damage. Now close the oil cap again. Let's check the engine cooling air inlets. They should be unobstructed. Verify the tension on the alternator belt. You can do this by turning the belt 90 degrees. If you can turn it more than 90 degrees, the belt is not sufficiently tight. If you can hardly turn it, the belt is too tight. Check the condition of the starter cam wheel. Ensure the starter is disconnected. 
Next, you'll check the leading edge and trailing edge of the propeller for nicks and security. Verify the general condition of the spinner. Let's check the air filter and check for restrictions by this or other form matter. Check the general condition of the exhaust. Make sure it's secure and verify if there are no large cracks etc. Now let's check the nose wheel strut. The shock strut should have a clearance of approximately 4 fingers or 2 inches. Verify the condition of the shimmy damper, the two steering rods and color. Check inflation and condition of the nose wheel tire. Let's move up to the left side of the nose section and check if the external power access panel is closed. Check if the static port is clear and check if no large leaks are noticed from the engine drain tubes. Section number 6, the left wing. Drain all 5 quick drains, check for smell, color, water and other contaminants. When done, pour the fuel back into the tank and measure the fuel quantity with a drip stick. Ensure the fuel filler cap is tightly sealed. Section 7. The left wing leading edge. Check the two cabin air intakes. Leading edge, heater tube and make sure the fuel vent is clear. This is important as any obstruction in the fuel vent may cause a reduction in power due to vacuum developing inside the tanks as fuel is consumed. Check the pneumatic stall warning opening for obstructions. Ensure the wing tie down is removed and check the general condition of the landing light and taxi light. Number 8. The left wing trailing edge. Start by checking the wingtip fence, the navigation light indicator, red navigation light, stroke light, wing fairing, the two aileron static dischargers, the three aileron balance weights, bonding strap, aileron actuator, aileron piano hinges and freedom of movement of the aileron. Verify the flap actuator, the two flap tracks and the general condition of the flap. Now we go back to the baggage compartment to stow away the fuel drip stick and drain cup. Make sure the tow bar is removed and stowed and verify if the trucks are removed and stowed as well. When all this has been completed, we can close the baggage compartment door and lock it with the key. Now, before you enter the cabin or when you have refueled, always stand in front of your airplane and execute a before entering cabin after refueling checklist. Check the area. Make sure that your prop wash cannot cause any damage to other people or property. Avoid starting up with your tail towards an open hangar. Check once again if both fuel filler caps are tightly sealed. Ensure all bonding cables, fuel hoses, ladders and fuel mats are removed. Check if no tow bars, trucks or tie downs are present. And last but not least, make sure your baggage compartment door is closed and locked. Now this completes the full in-depth pre-flight inspection. If you have any questions, comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. Thank you so much for watching again. I hope you enjoyed this pre-flight inspection tutorial. If you like my videos, don't forget to subscribe. Stay safe and join our personal training and style.